This is AgGrad Live. We have all of the different segments within the cotton. The show that explores what it's really like to work in the ag industry. So making sure that we get policy and regulatory issues. Straight from the people who live it every day. AgGrad Live, we are back after a one month hiatus. We, we took a little break from the weekly live show to figure out uh, what's this working? Were people liking it? And we found out that what people liked most of all was the career advice, the real value that we could bring to you about uh, tips and tricks and hacks that will help in your career. So we're back after a month and we have uh, got for you today a long awaited guest. She is not only a digital strategy consultant, but she is, I would say, the leading digital strategy consultant of all the digital strategy consultants I know in agriculture. So uh, I know a lot of you out there are very excited about this interview. Uh, we have on the show, Brooke Clay. So I'm gonna bring her on. Brooke, welcome to AgGrad Live. Hi, hi everyone. Thanks for joining us today. So Brooke, you have worked at uh, agencies before on, on the marketing side and digital strategy side. Uh, uh -huh. But for those uh, out there who may not know, what exactly is a digital strategy consultant? And, and I should have mentioned, you have your own company called Rural Gone Urban. Yes. So I like to explain a digital strategist as a, a problem solver. So I work with ag and food companies primarily. And what they come to me with is a problem. They are either trying to elevate their brand, they're trying to work on a campaign, and they say, here's our end goal. What can we do digitally to get us to that goal? And so I help with that team strategize, what do we need to do? What can we creatively do? What can we do outside of the box to get to that goal? Very cool. And so I know you've kind of you've worked your way up through the ranks. And those that read the description in this post for this video know that one of the things I wanted to talk with you about is, is what it means in your career to push boundaries. So maybe for starters, if you could just kind of tell us in, in your past, when have you had to push boundaries and kind of what does that look like exactly? Sure. So I should first start by saying I've been full time officially in the career world since 2010, so eight years. And my first job out of the gate was client side. I worked in a commodity organization. And what I found was every board meeting I went to, and every staff meeting I went to, everyone was, they were referencing the agency. Well, the agency said, or at this national meeting, the agency said, and I didn't understand why my opinion and what I was thinking and my pushback wasn't as valuable so I left traditional agriculture on purpose because I wanted to have as much clout in those meetings as whoever the agency was. But and you, so, but did you know you wanted to ultimately be in agriculture, but you had to leave to kind of get to where you wanted to be? Yes. Yeah, so I guess we could start at the bottom, really. And I am a ranch girl from central Oklahoma. I went to Oklahoma State University for two degrees. So I started in ag communications. Um, I stayed again for my master's and got my master's in international agriculture because I am ride or die ag. I wanted to tell the stories of farmers or ranchers, which is what I hear from a lot of people everywhere I go. And people ask, you know, how did you get to where you are? I want to do what you're doing. It's because we all want to tell these great stories. And so that that was always my plan. Very cool. And so you knew that in order to kind of get where you wanted to go, though, you had to go outside of agriculture. And where, where, where did that lead you? Sure. So, and the reason um, I'm a boundary pusher, I don't like when people tell me that I can't do something. And so my thought process is watch me. So for me, I needed to leave ag because ag was just one cyclical conversation. Hmm. The agency said this and the agency told the client and then the client talked about the other agency. And so I needed to break out of that pattern if I was going to bring something new into the conversation. So I found a job listing. Uh, for a travel blogger and eight years ago, a full-time paid position as a travel blogger was really interesting, right? Yeah. Like, it's I'm, still I'm, really interesting. It's so cool. <laughs> yeah. So there was this region of Oklahoma, 13 counties, and they were going under a brand new brand. Um, it's now known as Chickasaw Country. And so I was hired to launch their brand new website, hmm. be their social media manager, start their social properties from zero and to build whatever I wanted to build. So that meant I was taking my big SLR camera and I was covering concerts. So I covered Dirk Bentley, um, man, I, like everyone you could think of that would come to, 
South Central Oklahoma, I covered them. Uh, Lee Bryce was the coolest one I ever saw. He called me ma'am and I just, my heart melted. Um, <laughs> but I started everything from scratch and what I learned was I could cultivate a story and I was talking about mm. tourism, but it's not unlike agriculture. And so the story wasn't just one piece, right? It was the blog and then it was social media and then it was in-person interactions and it was a whole campaign. And that, that campaign and honestly was the first one I ever worked on and I really didn't even realize it was a campaign at first. It went on to win national awards and I thought, I'm onto something here. This is something that I can cultivate and I can bring back to ag. But before I brought it back to ag, I went on and I worked for North Carolina Tourism. So I took it from a section of Oklahoma to the whole state of North Carolina and I worked on some really large brands and I just, I couldn't absorb enough information. Um, it was just a really awesome period of my life that I get to really use in ag every day now. So you are, you're kind of naturally a, a boundary pusher for those out there watching that are thinking, okay, like she, that's her nature to push boundaries. Um, right. where, where, how can we kind of apply that to them? Like where, where should they know when to maybe push a little bit or when even maybe they're pushing too far? Sure. So because I'm a natural boundary pusher, it, I, I have to tell you that sometimes I really need to watch myself and I need to make sure that I'm being respectful in the way that I do it. I think you could ask my teachers in high school and in college, right? Like I'm a very passionate person, especially when I see um, an opening and a door. And and for me, digital media was that opening. So when I was in school, which less than 10 years ago, um, no one had, no professors had Facebook and no professors considered Twitter. And I was the one who, I'm sorry, Oklahoma State students, I set all those professors up with their first Facebook accounts. And I said, this is what we have to do. This is what I want to learn. And, and the very first pushback I had was, you can never make a job in this, Brooke. This is mm. not something you'll be able to do. Yeah, in the it's, Facebook. In the Facebook. And it was the <laughs> Facebook then. So, And now it's, it's my job. Or, you yeah. know, Facebook is a piece of my job. It's right. not my whole job. But I would say the easiest way to start pushing back, especially in a new job, if you're at a commodity organization, which is a natural path for many ad comm students, especially in their first career or first job out of school. And that is to ask the question, why? Why are we doing this? Um, you'll find in a lot of commodity groups, there is a set agenda for the year. They do the same things every year. The yeah. second week of February, it's the same thing and it will be for the next 10 years. And so my first job, I just started asking why why are we doing this? And if, you know, my job was in marketing, so I was tasked with, you know, really engaging with urban audience. And so my first question was, if you're tasking me with reaching an urban audience, why am I spending a significant portion of my budget reaching a rural audience? Hmm. You know, whether that- I have a good answer for that? That sounds like a good question. Well, I mean, honestly, um, and I think a lot of commodity groups um, face this, it's that if they're, producers don't know what they're talking to consumers about. They feel out of the loop. So a lot of commodity organizations spend a at least a small portion of their budget making sure that their consumer messaging is directed to their rural messaging or rural audience. Hmm. So that way their, you know, their constituents know that they're doing their jobs. Yeah, but for no, me, that, that was just, I mean, it makes sense. But for me, it was like, oh, I don't know. I could reach more <laughs> urban audiences if we don't do that. So that no, that actually makes a lot of sense. And it, it brings up a good point. I think, you know, uh, we talk a lot about uh, kind of millennials and, and uh, one one actually, I think, asset of millennials is they is they want to know why they don't they don't want to say, hey, I'll you know put in my 10 years for the company and then I'll understand what the heck we're doing here. You know, they want to see where what they're doing today fits into the bigger picture. And I, I think there's a a respectful way to do that. You know, some people will say, well, they're just going to call me that darn millennial that um, you know, mm -hmm. is entitled to know everything that they don't need to know. They just need to put their head down. But there is really a way to do that. And I think it's through, you know, kind of natural curiosity and showing that you're not, you know, you're not going to um, try to turn everything on its head without understanding why it's the way it is. And um, I do think that there's a good way to do that. If maybe for someone who who isn't naturally good at boundaries and they feel like they need to get better. Um, I, I get a lot of questions about mentorship, like, hey, might a mentor help me in this capacity? Uh, what, what would you say to people who might be looking for a mentor, whether it's to help them push boundaries or help them fit into their organization or grow in their career? Um, how, where can they look and how can they go find one? Because it's kind of awkward. You just have to ask. So I have two very specific examples. 
So I have an intern and I didn't know I wanted an intern. Honestly, I really didn't want an intern. I didn't think I needed an intern. But last year I received an email out of the blue from a high school sophomore mm -hmm. who sent me a well-written email and said, I would love to meet you for coffee. She couldn't even drive yet. Um, and I, I want to know more about what you do. And she ended up pitching me why she needed to be my intern and she wanted oh, to work wow. for free. And I was like, I am sold on you. <laughs> and so now we have this natural, she is an officially an intern. She gets paid and we have a, you know, a great mentorship where I get to walk her through some projects. And sometimes we're not even working on rural gone urban projects or working projects that she's interested in personally. Mm -hmm. um, but another example is Hannah. Well, before, before you go oh. to the other example, I'd like to sure. ask, so what, what was her pitch? You know, I think one of the awkward things about mentorship is like, what do I have to give this person? Like I have, you know, I'm only asking for something and not giving. So what was her pitch that compelled you? Her pitch was, I have so much to learn from you and just let me learn like you don't have to pay me like she didn't want to be a bother so her pitch was i will be so uninvasive as an as a shadow or a job shadow or an intern you mm -hmm. won't even know i'm around but just let me see what you do and what you operate to make sure it's what i want to do and as the conversation evolved i asked her what her goals are and she has her eyes set on um the state ffa award for ag communication ag communications placement and she was a sophomore so yeah, her impressive. thought process was, hey, you're here in my home county. You are doing, I have national clients. And she you know, knew that from creeping online. And she said, this is an opportunity and I just can't pass it. I can't pass it up. And for me, a, a high school sophomore, I can't imagine me doing that. Like I was just so impressed. That's awesome. So watch That's out. Awesome. Yeah, she's so great. Um, but I have another example yeah. of just pure in, you know, mentorship, just asking questions. Hannah Borg sent me a Twitter direct message and said, hey, I'd love to hop on the phone for 30 minutes. Do you have time? It was, that was it. And I said, sure, what's up? And I told her I was actually driving to Indiana. Um, I, I guess it was last fall. And she said, yeah, I was like, here's you know my availability, give me a call. And we ended up talking on the phone for an hour and she asked me about my job. She told me about what she might wanna do in life. And we just started a conversation and from then, you know, she sent me, you know, some documents every now and then. And we just have this, you know, very natural mentorship. I wouldn't say it's, uh, you know, 100 percent internship or mentorship. It's very open. But I think if you don't ask, you won't know. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And there, I think you sell yourself short, too, if you if you act like you have nothing to give, because right. um, you know people want to give back. You just have to make it easy for them. You know, at least show show empathy like, you know, Hannah, great example. Do you have 30 minutes? Not like, hey, can we meet for coffee once a week for the next eternity? Right. It's, it's showing right. some sort of like, you know, yeah. I'm going to be mindful of you and your time and that you're, you're busy. Um, so mm -hmm. that's cool. And, and obviously we know. Uh, Hannah Borg, those of you who will follow uh, Agrad on Snapchat and, and saw the last Agrad Live, which we did with Hannah and Fricky. So that's that's cool. Very, very good examples. Now, you've done you've done a lot in your career. And even though it's been short, you're, you're still very young, uh, but you've done you've done a lot. Uh, have you been in the situation? Uh, because I know several people watching have, which is um, you're asked to do something, either a job or a project or work for a client or take a career step that you're not 100% sure you're ready for it yet. Um, if you've been in that situation, kind of help walk us through how you approach that and how others might. So the first thing to know is it's okay to be frustrated in your career. It's not okay to be frustrated forever in your career. I think it's mm. always good to take a step back and say, okay, what is really the issue? Am I frustrated because I don't like this or am I frustrated because I don't know what I'm doing? Mm -hmm. Right. I think it's really yeah. important to address why am I frustrated? Um, but yes. So at my last agency position, um, I was hired to do influencer programs primarily and digital social media content. And it transitioned to being a project manager for a global rollout of affiliate websites, which websites, while I was more than capable, I'm a very organized person of doing that. It was not something A, I'd been trained in or B, I really wanted to do, right? I didn't want to spend my time thinking about SSL certificates and making sure that they were there. And I had to, what is an SSL certificate? I could tell you today, I knew it's something I no you should idea. have, but, right? Like, like I had to learn all of these things about websites. And, you know, as I worked to transition, I knew that my long-term plan was not to be working 
in a big city. That's not where I thrive. I love, you know, being able to walk through pastures and, and feed the cattle. And that's just not something I'm going to get in downtown Nashville or downtown Austin. Um, so I knew that eventually I wanted to be able to work wherever I needed to work. And so in that situation, I had to address it head on. And so I did meet with my supervisor and say, guys, like this isn't fulfilling for me. This is frustrating. And, and honestly, I'm not the right person for this job. There are more qualified people. And I really had to kind of swallow my pride because I'm a perfectionist and say, I really am not like I want to service this client in the best way possible. And this isn't the best way possible. And so I think honest conversations are really the only way you can address something like that, because there might be an opportunity where you could learn and say, you know, if you are honest and say, hey, I am not well equipped for this, but I'm willing to learn. That's one thing. But if I'm also not equipped, but I'm pretty sure I'm not going to be able to figure this out, like you just have to be honest because yeah. the longer you let that go on, like the bigger your hole is going to get. That's so true. That is so true. I see that as a recruiter all the time. I talk to I talk to clients and candidates both where I can see things aren't going well. And I can see that if I'm talking to a candidate, they, they really, if they were just to come clean and be transparent with their employer, uh, their life could get a lot better and they probably would find a spot where they would thrive. And maybe it's not the right role. I mean, I'm not saying, you know, find any way you can to stay with your current employer. Sometimes there's reasons to make moves. But uh, but yeah, I think that is extremely true that transparency is the best. Um, the other thing I see is people trying so hard to get a job that they try to change who they are to get that job uh, when you're just going to be sorely disappointed. If you, if you, even if you get it, you might be happy for the first month, but after that, it, it, you know, you really need to find the best sincere fit for you, you know, put your best foot forward, but, but don't pretend to be something you're not. It takes being honest with yourself. Um, I, I want to get to Brooke. There is some questions uh, in the comments for you. So I'm going to move this screen here. Bear with me. Uh, to only show you and the question. Uh, the first one here is from Callie Curley, uh, who, who asks, how do you balance a full-time career in your industry um, while still trying to build your own business? And, and I don't know if you built Rural Gone Urban on the side. I definitely know you built kind of your personal brand um, as you were working. Are there boundaries, goals you can't cross until you're fully uh, self-employed? Uh-oh, do we just lose Brooke? I think we might have lost her. And this is uh, this is a question that uh, as we wait for her to kind of jump back on here uh, that actually I had to face too. I started at grad when I was working full time um, and it is a challenge and, and there are some limitations. But no, I, to answer your question in the digital age, and this is new and you might not get this advice from maybe people who are more old school. Uh, but I think in the digital age, you have a personal brand, even if you have a full time job working for another brand. Uh, and I think you should absolutely be building that brand, whether that is your own name or whether that is a side hustle you have. Uh, you do need to make sure it's not competitive. And uh, along the lines of the last question, make sure you're being completely transparent with your employer uh, so that they know what's going on. And, and um, you don't want it to create animosity just because you haven't talked about it. Um, and I think we lost Brooke here. Uh, Maria, I see Maria, you also have a question. Uh, working with, uh, let's see here, small firms on contract uh, graphic design. Uh, you love it. I'm wondering where you should tr uh, strategically place yourself in this big, wide digital ag world to get better attention from bigger firms. Okay, this is definitely a question from Brooke. So I'm going to ask Brooke to uh, respond in the comments, Maria, so that you can make sure that you get your question answered. Um, and anyone who watching who wants to check that out, Check out the AgRad Facebook page, find this video, and you will see Brooks, I'm sure, very insightful answer. So thank you all very much for uh, being uh, today on AgGrad Live. We are going to be back next week focusing more on career advice. I would love it if you would uh, download the podcast, AgGrad Live. Brooke, you're back. I have no idea what happened. I don't either. I don't uh, but <laughs> I'm glad you're back because Maria has a question that I cannot answer. And okay. I was trying to field the questions, but uh, uh, what, let's get Maria's question in. She says okay. she works with a lot of small firms on contracted design, uh, graphic design work. She loves it. And she's wondering where she could strategically place herself in this big, wide digital ag world to get attention from bigger firms. Oh, that's such a great question. Also, I work with Maria all the time. She's super talented. So anyone watching her, you should visit her website. Um, I'll drop it in the comments. 
Um, but so Maria, what I would do first is I, you've done all of the basics. Your website is incredible. It's better than a lot of agency sites that I visited. And I think the biggest thing is to target those key players in those agencies and those corporate comm teams and send them a message on LinkedIn. It's a safer space. I would avoid Facebook. I would avoid Twitter. I would send them a direct message and say, hey, this is what I do. Here are some of my samples. What what should I do to move forward? Because honestly, a lot of times they're really looking for a fresh face and fresh designs, and they just need to know that you exist. Very good. Very cool. All right. I want to get back to Callie, Callie Curley's question because I tried to answer it and I think okay. I did a crappy job. So okay. she, Callie is asking, uh, how do you balance a full-time career in your industry while trying to build your own business? Are there boundaries and goals that you can't cross until you're fully self-employed? Yes. And yes. So the first thing you should know is you're not going to sleep a lot. Um, you need to give up your nights and your weekends because it is two full-time jobs, basically. Um, so some of the boundaries that you can't cross, um, you're depending on where you work, there's going to be a conflict of interest. So don't ever go um, and try to pull in any of the clients that you have um, at your full time job um, if you're working in an agency. Um, definitely make sure you're never working on your side hustle during your full time hustle. That is just a moral line that I personally would. You just can't cross that. That's not appropriate. Um, but you can com completely build a brand. You know, Rural Gone Urban's brand wasn't built overnight. It actually started as a blog when I moved from college to Oklahoma City. It started as just a, a way to share with my family um, all the things and adventures that I was doing. So that was a little bit different of a progression. Um, but you, um, someone who's a good example of this, I have a great friend, Hannah, who you guys probably know from AgGrad Nation and that she has a full-time agency job, but she sometimes takes on side fun hustles. And so she has a website that is her side hustle job. She does a lot of similar things, um, but it's totally possible. But know that there are some boundaries and the biggest boundary is you can't work on your side hustle at the same time you're getting paid from your full-time hustle. Very cool. All right, and and last but certainly not least, uh, I'm gonna put up your, your uh, Username, Rural Gone Urban on everything, Instagram, Twitter, uh, Facebook, et cetera. But how else can all of us at AgGrad help make Brooke more successful? Um, you guys already are. We engage <laughs> online. We have you know great conversations. I think that's what's important to me on social media, on my personal brand. It's not how many people are following my accounts. It's how many people send me a direct message or reply to me on Twitter when they see something cool. I love the conversations. Um, also, if you want to do something really cool, I'm about to do something that's totally lame to him, but you know, it's on brand. Do it. Yes. Are you sure? Yeah, absolutely. Dad, my dog hit 3000 followers this week. Look how cute she is. All right. Is it, is it at Molly, the cow dog or what is it? It's cow dog, Molly, cow Molly wake up. dog, Molly on Instagram. Yes. All so right. She, we went to the vet today. She is 7.1 pounds of fluff. But I need you to know that she runs with the cow dogs on this place more than the cow dogs run on this place. She thinks truly that she's a great Pyrenees. So I don't know. It started as a joke, but some, somehow it's snowballing. She's a legit influencer. She's like a case study for you uh, helping yeah. other influencers with their digital strategy. Really? And what I would tell everyone is there is no magic formula to becoming a, an influencer. It's really about frequency consistency and curating a brand, making sure that you pick, you know, three topics and sticking to it and making content that really always falls back to that brand in some way. Okay. I, I'm going to come back and watch that part because I meant to take notes there, but I thought it'd be awkward because I'm on camera. But uh, Brooke, thank you so much for, for being yeah. on the show. This has been really, really cool and helpful. And you definitely have like boosted my street cred just by being part of that. So thank you. No, you boosted my street cred. <laughs> really cool on my Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all for, for those of you tuned in live or, or those that didn't, please make sure you go over and subscribe to our podcast on iTunes or wherever podcasts are played and, and also on YouTube. You can see this there as well. So uh, thank you. And let us know what you think of the new format, focusing more on career advice. And Brooke, can't thank you enough for contributing here today. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you for joining AgGrad Live. Visit aggrad.com. That's A-G-G-R-A-D 
To join the community, create your profile and learn more about careers in the agriculture industry.